Alright, hello everyone. I hope you've been having a good time. Um, so for tonight, I was hoping to do something just, um, you know, a bit more in line with what we normally do. Um, hello, Caffrey. Thank you for dropping in. It's good to have you here. Uh, and... Yeah, so tonight we are going to be going through The Little Mermaid, as originally written by Hans Christian Andersen. Um, now, The Little Mermaid itself is actually uh, one of the better known works. Um, it also differs fairly dramatically from what, uh, what Disney had way back when, but that's okay. Um, it just might not be quite as... Uh, Chill, I suppose, as some of you might remember. But, uh... That's alright. So, with that said, um, I'll give just a moment for people to filter in. I know some people are fond of this particular story. Um, so about 30 seconds, we'll get started on the story. Um, also, for those who are not necessarily as familiar with Twitch itself, um, I have accepted affiliate ship, so there should now be uh, point redeems available in the channel. Um, we have a few different ones available. Um, most of them are silly little things like have me write a poem or um, have me drink some water. Um, and you, you're all encouraged uh, to try them out if you'd like. Um, there can be a very fun way to interact with people who are streaming. And, uh, so, yeah. The Little Mermaid by Hans Christian Andersen Far out in the ocean, where the water is as blue as the prettiest cornflower and as clear as crystal, it is very, very deep. So deep, indeed, that no cable could fathom it. Many church steeples, piled one on top of another, would not reach from the ground beneath the surface to the water above. There dwell the Sea King and his subjects. We must not imagine that there is nothing at the bottom of the sea but bare yellow sand. No, indeed. The most singular flowers and plants grow there, the leaves and stems of which are so pliant, the slightest agitation of the water causes them to stir as if they had life. Fishes, both large and small, glide between the branches as birds fly among the trees here upon land. In the deepest spot of all stands the castle of the Sea King. Its walls are built of coral, and the long, gothic windows are of clearest amber. The roof is formed of shells that open and close as water flows over them. Their appearance is very beautiful, for in each lies a glittering pearl which would be fit for the diadem of a queen. The Sea King had been a widower for many years, and his aged mother kept house for him. She was a very wise woman, and exceedingly proud of her high birth. On that account, she wore twelve oysters on her tail, while others, also of high rank, were only allowed to wear six. She was, however, deserving of very great praise, especially for her care of the little sea princesses, her granddaughters. There were six beautiful children, but the youngest was the prettiest of them all. Her skin was as clear and delicate as a rose leaf, and her eyes as blue as the deepest sea. But, like all the others, she had no feet, and her body ended in a fish's tail. All day long they played in the great halls of the castle, or among the living flowers that grew out of the walls. The large amber windows were open, and fish swam in, just as the swallows fly into our houses when we open the windows, excepting that the fishes swam up to the princesses, ate out of their hands, and allowed themselves to be stroked. Outside the castle there was a beautiful garden, in which grew bright red and dark blue flowers, and blossoms like flames of fire. The fruit glittered like gold, and the leaves and stems waved to and fro continually. Wearing oysters on their tails was not added to the Disney versions? I don't know, Caffrey, but it's quite the fun idea, isn't it? 
The earth itself was the finest sand, but blue as the flame of burning sulfur. Over everything lay a peculiar blue radiance, as if it were summoned from the air above, through which the blue sky shone, instead of the dark depths of the sea. In calm weather, the sun could be seen, looking like a purple flower, with the light stemming off from the calyx. Each of the young princesses had a little plot of ground in the garden, where she might dig and plant as she pleased. One arranged her flower bed into the form of a whale, another thought it would be better to make hers the figure of a little mermaid, but that of the youngest was round like the sun, and contained flowers as red as his rays at sunset. She was a strange child, quiet and thoughtful, and while her sisters would be delighted with the wonderful things which they had obtained from the wrecks of vessels, she cared for nothing but her pretty red flowers. Like the sun, excepting a beautiful marble statue. It was the representation of a handsome boy, carved out of pure white stone, which had fallen to the bottom from the sea of the sea from a wreck. She planted by the statue a rose colored weeping willow, it grew splendidly, and very soon hung its fresh branches over the statue, almost down to the blue sands. The shadow had a violet tint and waved to and fro like the branches. It seemed as if the crown of the tree and the root were at play and trying to kiss each other. Nothing gave her so much pleasure as to hear about the world above the sea. She made her old grandmother tell her all she knew of the ships and of the towns, the people and the animals. To her it seemed the most wonderful and beautiful to hear that the flowers of the land should have fragrance and not those below the sea that the trees of the forest should be green, and that the fishes among the trees could sing so sweetly that it was pleasure to hear them. Her grandmother called the little birds fishes, or she would not have understood her, for she had never seen birds. When you have reached your fifteenth year, said the grandmother, you will have permission to rise up out of the sea, to sit on the rocks in the moonlight, while the great ships are sailing by, and then you will see both forests and towns. In the following year, one of the sisters would be fifteen, but as each was a year younger than the other, the youngest would have to wait five years before her turn came to rise up from the bottom of the ocean and see the earth as we do. However, each was promised to tell the others what she saw on her first visit, and Yes, fishes among the trees, those are called birds, Caffrey. But the point was that the girl in question was too young and had never seen a fish. However, each promised to tell the others what she saw on her first visit and what she thought the most beautiful. For their grandmother could not tell them enough. There were so many things on which they wanted more information. None of them longed so much for her turn to... Uh, none of them longed so much for her turn to come as the youngest, she who had the longest time to wait, and who was so quiet and thoughtful. Many nights she stood by the open window, looking up through the dark blue water, and watching the fish as they splashed about with their fins and tails. She could see the moon and the stars shining faintly, but the water they looked larger than they do to our eyes. When something like a black cloud passed between her and them, she knew it was either a whale swimming overhead or a ship full of human beings who never imagined that a pretty little mermaid was standing beneath them, holding out her white hands toward the keel of their ship. As soon as the eldest was fifteen, she was allowed to rise to the surface of the ocean. When she came back, she had hundreds of things to talk about, but the most beautiful, as she said, was to lie in the moonlight on a sandbank, in the quiet sea near the coast, and to gaze on a large town nearby, where lights were twinkling like hundreds of stars, to listen to the sound of the music, the noise of carriages, and the voices of human beings, and then to hear the merry bells peal out from the church steeples, and because she could not go near to all those wonderful things, she longed for them more than ever. Oh, did not the youngest sister listen eagerly to all these descriptions? 
and afterward, when she stood at the open window looking up through the dark blue water, she thought that the great city, with all its bustle and noise, and even fancied she could hear the sound of the church bells down in the depths of the sea. In another year, the second sister received permission to rise to the surface of the water and to swim about where she pleased. She rose just as the sun was setting. And this, she said, was the most beautiful sight of all. The whole sky looked like gold, while violet and rose-colored clouds, which she could not describe, floated over her, and still more rapidly than the clouds flew a large flock of wild swans toward the setting sun, looking like a long white veil across the sea. She also swam toward the sun, but it sunk into the waves, and the rosy tints faded from the clouds and from the sea. Hmm, of course they've seen fish, you're absolutely right. The third sister's turn followed, and she was the boldest of them all, and swam up a broad river that emptied itself into the sea. On the banks she saw green hills covered with beautiful vines. Palaces and castles peeped out amid the proud trees of the forest. She heard the birds singing, and the rays of the sun were so powerful that she was obliged often to dive down under the water to cool her burning face. In a narrow creek she found a whole troop of little human children, quite naked, and sporting about in the water. She wanted to play with them, but they had f fled in a great fright. And then a little black animal came to the water. It was a dog, but she did not know that, for she had never seen one before. The animal barked at her so terribly that she became frightened, and rushed back to the open sea. But she said she should never forget the beautiful forest, the green hills, and the pretty little children who could swim in the water, although they had not a fish's tails. Yes, a saltwater mermaid in this story can swim upstream in a freshwater river. Or at least we assume it's a freshwater river. Now, hypothetically, it could have become a saltwater river at one point or another, and I wouldn't be any the wiser. The fourth sister was more timid. She remained in the midst of the sea, but she said it was quite as beautiful there as near the land. She could see for so many miles around her, and the sky above looked like a bell of glass. She had seen the ships, but at such a great distance that they looked like seagulls. The dolphins sported in the waves, and the great whales spouted water from their nostrils till it seemed as if hundred fountains were playing in every direction. The fifth sister's birthday occurred in the winter, so when her t turn came, she saw what the others had not seen the first time they went up. Mm, excuse me. The sea looked quite green, and large icebergs were floating about, each like a pearl, she said, but larger and loftier than the churches built by men. They were the most singular shapes, and glittered like diamonds. She had seated herself upon one of the largest and let the wind play with her long hair, and she remarked that all the ships sailed by rapidly and steered as far away as they could from the iceberg, as if they were afraid of it. Toward evening, as the sun went down, dark clouds covered the sky. Thunder rolled and lightning flashed, and the red light glowed on the icebergs as they rocked and tossed. Oh! Oh, welcome, raiders! Hello! Pa, oh, it's good to see you! Thank you for dropping in! <laughs> Hello, Grayson. Uh, I'm sorry to hear about your knee, but I uh, hope that you do find your way back to being an adventurer once you've had a chance to get through rehab. Saltwater rivers don't exist, says Caffrey. Brackish water are found in bays, deltas, and river mouths, but those are not rivers where a river connects to an ocean. So, yes, raiders. Um, oh, let's uh, get a quick shout out to Pa here. So, uh, thank you very much for joining me, everybody. Uh, my name is Celine Heidelman. I mostly spend time reading stories for people. Um, pa really wanted to be an adventurer as well. Although, as far as I can tell, Pa absolutely is an adventurer, or at least the adventurous sort. 
Thank you, Pa. I do appreciate being called a Kiri. How was your stream? Did you have a good time? Toward the evening, as the sun went down, dark clouds covered the sky, the thunder rolled and the lightning flashed, and the red light glowed on the icebergs as they rocked and tossed from the heaving sea. <laughs> no, Caffrey, I don't have the uh, bot in here. Instead, you just have to use the regular Twitch shoutout, which I don't know if you're able to do. Ah, Paul was playing Skyrim, hence the arrow to the knee jokes. I see. Well, I hope it went well. Long and a pain in the random seed. I see. Oh, Paul was actually playing Zelda. Uh, which Zelda? Was it Breath of the Wild or Tears of the Kingdom? Grayson slept during stream, woke up to prepare for the raid, and is here. And we're delighted to have you, Grayson. Thank you so much for coming in. Oh, Ocarina of Time with a random seed. <laughs> hey, that's not the only game I've seen you play. I've also seen you switch over to Majora's Mask and things of that nature. <gasps> oh, dear. On all the ships, the sails were reefed with fear and trembling, while she sat calmly on the floating iceberg, watching the blue lightning as it darted its forked flashes into the sea. <laughs> yes, Caffrey, Pa is uh, quite frequently a player of Ocarina of Time, among many other Legend of Zelda games. When first the sisters had permission to rise to the surface, they were each delighted with the new and beautiful sights they saw. But now, as grown-up girls, they could go when they pleased, and had become indifferent about it. They wished themselves back again in the water, and after a month had passed, they said it was much more beautiful down below, and pleasanter to be at home. Yet often, in the evening hours, the five sisters would twine their arms round each other and rise to the surface in a row. They had more beautiful voices than any human being could have, and before the approach of a storm and when they expected a ship would be lost, they swam before the vessel and sang sweetly of the delights to be found in the depths of the sea, and begged the sailors not to fear if they sank to the bottom. But the sailors could not understand the song. They took it for the howling of the storm. And these things were never to be beautiful for them, for if their ship sank, the men and were drowned, and their dead bodies alone reached the palace of the Sea King. Welcome, raiders! Hello, uh, Sophia Ignosi. I don't think I've uh, met you before, but thank you very much for dropping in. <laughs> That was quite the sound. <laughs> All right, let's see here. How is that spelled? Sophia Ignosi. Yes, yeah, so welcome in. Um, I hope you're all uh, having a good time here. Uh, FT Waste and Sophia, thank you both for the follows. Um, how are you all doing here? Uh, do you have a good stream? I don't uh, quite see what you all were playing here, but uh, let's see if I can find that out real quick. Oh, it looks like you were uh, primarily doing some teaching of some sort. I, I have an apple pie on my face? What on earth? <laughs> what is this? I don't think I've ever seen a box fall on my head. Ah! Voyage of Dr. Doolittle. Oh, I see. So you're also reading books. That's wonderful to hear. Hold on, let me make certain that I am following you so that I can see when you next go live, too. Boop. Indeed, though, Dr. Doolittle is one of considered. How did it go? Uh, did you get through the whole thing, or was it uh, only partway through? <laughs> Indeed. Reading streamers unite. Ooh, only one part left. I'll definitely have to drop in for the final part then if I can. That's so nice. <laughs> Alright. Um, so as far as we've been going in the story here, um, 
Mr. Anderson has set the scene quite lovely. Uh, there have been multiple explanations for the sea below. Oh! <laughs> uh, thank you, Crusader Corrupted and Darth Parmuris. Or Parmu Parmuis. Of Darth Parmuis. Uh, thank you both for following. It's good to have you with us. Um, and so they are talking about uh, the five of the six sisters have all been up to the surface, which is a ritual that they perform at the time that they become adults. And so we're looking forward to seeing what the sixth sister, who is most obsessed with the world above, is going to do on her time. When the sisters rose, arm in arm through the water this way, their youngest sister would stand quite alone, looking after them, ready to cry, only that the mermaids have no tears, and therefore they suffer more. Oh, were I but fifteen years old, said she, I know that I shall love the world up there, and all the people who live in it. At last, when she reached her fifteenth year, well, now you are grown up, said the old dowager, her grandmother. So you must let me adorn you like your other sisters. And she placed a wreath of white lilies in her hair, and every flower leaf was half a pearl. Then the old lady ordered eight great oysters to attach themselves to the tail of the princess to show her high rank. That they hurt me so, said the little mermaid. Pride must suffer pain, replied the old lady. Oh, how gladly she would have shaken off all this grandeur and laid aside the heavy wreath. The red flowers in her own garden would have suited her much better, but she could not help herself, so she said, Farewell, and rose up as lightly as a bubble to the surface of the water. Indeed, I hope all the readers enjoy the stream. Thank you for coming in. The sun had just set as she raised her head above the waves, but the clouds were tinted with crimson and gold, and though the glimmering twilight beamed the evening star in all its beauty, the sea was calm and the air was mild and fresh. A large ship with three masts lay becalmed on the water, with only one sail set, for not a breeze stifled, and the sailors sat idle on deck or amongst the rigging. There was music and song on board, and as darkness came on, a hundred colored lanterns were lighted, as if the flags of all nations waved in the air. The Little Mermaid swam close to the cabin windows, and now and then, as the waves lifted her up, she could look in through the clear glass window panes and see a number of well-dressed people within. Hmm, I think that mermaid and prince image might come a little bit later. Among them was a young prince, the most beautiful of all, with large black eyes. He was sixteen years of age, and his birthday was being kept with much rejoicing. The sailors were dancing on deck, but when the prince came out of the cabin, more than a hundred rockets rose in the air, making it bright as day. The little mermaid was so startled that she dived under the water, and when she again stretched out her head, it appeared as if all the stars of heaven were falling around her. She had never seen such fireworks before. Great suns spurted fire about, splendid fireflies flew into the blue air, and everything was reflected in the clear, calm sea beneath. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, Darth. Um, if you want to tell me how to pronounce it, I'll do my best. Um, but I thank you for dropping in. It's good to have you. Great guns spurted fire about. Splendid fireflies flew into the blue air, and everything was reflected in the clear, calm sea beneath. The ship itself was so brightly illuminated that all the people, and even the smallest rope, could be distinctly and plainly seen. And how handsome the young prince looked, as he dressed the hands of all present and smiled at them, while the music resounded through the clear night air. It was very late, yet the little mermaid could not take her eyes from the ship or from the beautiful prince. The colored lanterns had been extinguished, no more rockets rose into the air, and the cannon had ceased firing, but the sea became restless 
and a moaning, grumbling sound could be heard beneath the waves. Still, the Little Mermaid remained by the cabin window, rocking up and down on the water, which enabled her to look in. Jeffrey? <laughs> Hold on. <laughs> After a while, the sails were quickly unfurled, and the noble ship continued her passage. But soon the waves rose higher, heavy clouds darkened the sky, and lightning appeared in the distance. A dreadful storm was approaching. Once more the sails were reefed, and the great ship pursued her flying course over the raging sea. The waves rose mountains high as if they would have overtopped the mast, but the ship dived like a swan between them, and then rose again on their lofty, foaming crests. To the Little Mermaid this appeared a pleasant sport. Not so to the sailors. At length, the ship groaned and creaked. The thick planks gave way under the lashing of the sea as it broke over the deck. The mainmast snapped asunder like a reed. The ship lay over on her side. The water rushed in. The little mermaid now perceived that the crew were in danger. Even she herself was obliged to be careful to avoid the beams and planks of the wreck which lay scattered on the water. At one moment it was so pitch dark that she could not see a single object, but a flash of lightning would reveal the whole scene. She could see everyone who had been on board excepting the prince. When the ship parted, she had seen him sink into the deep waves, and she was glad, for she thought he would now be with her. And then she remembered that human beings could not live in the water, so that when he got down to her father's palace he would be quite dead. <laughs> that was well timed. Silence, someone. Thank you so much for the follow. <laughs> oh, <laughs> that's true. I did announce that. I did forget to announce that I was going live today. You're not wrong, Kefri. <laughs> Only the second. Ah, I see. Um, hello, silent someone. Uh, my name is Celine Heidelman. I. I uh, read stories on stream here. Uh, we've had a couple of raiders uh, raid out to me. Uh, Nalapa and um, Sophia Ignosi, both. Um, <laughs> so you're currently listening to The Little Mermaid, as written by Hans Christian Andersen. Uh, I'm not entirely certain who the translator was offhand. <laughs> oh, I see. You were on Sophia's stream. Well... I hope that you enjoy the stream here, and don't feel bad if you fall asleep. I've been told that my reading does have the ability to put some folks to sleep, and that's alright. I hope it's a good nap if you get one. <laughs> alright. <laughs> mm, but he must not die. So she swam about among the beams and planks which strewed the surface of the sea, forgetting that they could crush her to pieces. Then she dived deeply under the dark waters, rising and falling with the waves, till at length she managed to reach the young prince, who f was fast losing the power of swimming in that stormy sea. <laughs> oh, Silent's already fallen asleep twice. <laughs> it sounds like you need some good rest. <laughs> Thank you for the compliment, Capri. <laughs> his limbs were failing him, his beautiful eyes were closed, and he would have died had not the Little Mermaid come to his assistance. She held his head above the water, and let the waves drift them where they would. In the morning, the storm had ceased, but of the ship not a single fragment could be seen. The sun rose up, red and glowing from the water, and its beams brought back the hue of the earth to the prince's cheeks, but his eyes remained closed. The mermaid kissed his high, smooth forehead and stroked back his wet hair. He seemed to her like the marble statue in her little garden, and she kissed him again and wished that he might live. Presently, they came in sight of land. She saw lofty blue mountains on which the white snow rested as if a flock of swans were lying upon them. Oh, you're a programmer, Silent Someone. That's awesome. Um, I've 
been a software developer previously as well. And yes, Caffrey, very much the mermaid is smooching. <laughs> hmm. Near the coast were beautiful green forests, and close by stood a large building. Whether a church or a convent, she could not tell. Orange and citron trees grew in the garden, and before the door stood lofty palms. The sea here formed a little bay in which the water was quite still, but very deep. So she swam with the handsome prince to the beach, which was covered with fine white sand, and there she laid him in the warm sunshine, taking care to raise his head higher than his body. Then bells sounded in the large white building, and a number of young girls came into the garden. The little mermaid swam out farther from the shore and placed herself between some high rocks that rose out of the water. Then she covered her head and neck with the foam of the sea so that her little face might not be seen, and watched to see what would become of the poor prince. Oh, you're also a writer. That's very neat. <laughs> oh, Darth, I, I understand that particular uh, impulse. I have a friend who was playing Kingdom Hearts and went through the Little Mermaid level recently, too, and uh, then ended up singing that song as part of a redeem. So, uh, yeah, it's the Disney is strong in many ways. She did not wait long before she saw a young girl approach the spot where he lay. She seemed frightened at first, but only for a moment. Then she fetched a number of people, and the mermaid saw that the prince came to life again, and smiled upon those who stood round him. But to her he sent no smile. He knew not that she had saved him. This made her unhappy, and when he was led away into the great building, she dived down sorrowfully into the water and return to her father's castle. <laughs> I'm glad you're enjoying my voice, Silent. She had always been silent and thoughtful, and now she was more so than ever. Her sisters asked her what she had seen during her first visit to the surface of the water, but she would tell them nothing. Many an evening and morning did she rise to the place where she had left the prince. She saw the fruits of the garden ripen till they were gathered, the snow on the top of the map. <laughs> Hello, Queen of Death. Thank you very much for joining in. It's good to see you. <laughs> and saying silent twice was just a nice exercise on my part as far as I'm concerned. She saw the fruits in the garden ripen till they were gathered. The snow on the top of the mountains melt away, but she never saw the prince. And therefore, she returned home always more sorrowful than before. It was her only comfort to sit in her own little garden and fling her arm around the beautiful marble statue, which was like the prince. But she gave up tending her flowers. Okay, have a wonderful work, Queen of Death. <laughs> Thank you for coming in again. And they grew in wild confusion over the paths, twining their long leaves and stems round the branches of the trees, so that the whole place became dark and gloomy. At length, she could bear no longer, and told one of her sisters all about it. The others heard the secret, and soon it became known to two mermaids whose intimate friend happened to know who the prince was. She had also seen the festival aboard the ship, and she told them where the prince had come from, and where his palace stood. Come, little sister, said the other princesses. They entwined their arms and rose up in a long row to the surface of the water, close by the spot where they knew the prince's palace stood. It was built of bright yellow shining stone with long flights of marble steps, one of which reached quite down to the sea. Splendid, gilded cupolas rose over the roof, and between the pillars that surrounded the whole building stood lifelike statues of marble. Through the clear crystal of the lofty windows could be seen noble rooms with costly silk curtains and hangings of tapestry, while the walls were covered with beautiful paintings which were a pleasure to look at. In the center of the largest saloon, a fountain threw its sparkling jets high up into the glass cupola of the ceiling, through which the sun shone down upon the water and upon the beautiful plants growing round the basin of the fountain. 
now that she knew where he lived, she spent many an evening and many a night on the water near the palace. She would swim much nearer to the shore than any of the others ventured to do. Indeed, once she went quite up the narrow channel, under the marble balcony, which threw a broad shadow on the water. <laughs> oh, I see. Ooh, be prepared is a fun one. If we get through the story early enough, I'll definitely have to give it a sing, just for the sake of it. And, you know, we'll see what happens from there. Let's see here. Here she would sit and watch the young prince, who thought himself quite alone in the bright moonlight. She saw him many times of an evening sailing in a pleasant boat, with music playing and flags waving. She peeped out from among the green rushes, and if the wind caught her long, silvery-white veil, those who saw it believed it to be a swan spreading out its wings. On many nights, too, when the fishermen with their torches were out at sea, she heard them relate so many good things about the doings of the young prince that she was glad she had saved his life when he had been tossed about half-dead on the waves. <laughs> they see Cafe is also a fan. And she remembered that his head had rested on her bosom, and how heartily she had kissed him. But he knew nothing of all this, and could not even dream of her. She grew more and more fond of human beings, and wished more and more to be able to wander about with those whose world seemed so much larger than her own. They could fly over the sea in ships, and mount the high hills which were far above the clouds, and the lands they possessed, their woods and their fields, stretched far away beyond the reach of her sight. There was so much that she wished to know, and her sisters were unable to answer all her questions. Then she applied to her old grandmother, who knew all about the upper world, which she very rightly called the lands above the sea. <gasps> oh, Caffrey, yes. When I was a young warthog! Or something like that, I suppose. If human beings are not drowned, asked the little mermaid, can they live forever? Do they never die, as we do here in the sea? Hmm. Yes, replied the old lady. They must also die, and their term of life is even shorter than ours. We sometimes live to three hundred years, but when we cease to exist here, we only become the foam on the surface of the water, and we have not even a grave down here to those we love. We have not immortal souls. We shall never live again. But like the green seaweed, when once it has been cut off, we can never flourish more. Human beings, on the contrary, have a soul which lives on forever, lives after the body has been turned to dust. It rises up through the clear, pure air beyond the glistening stars. As we rise out of the water, we behold the land of the earth. So do they rise, the unknown and glorious regions which we shall never see. <laughs> Ah, the Fantasia movies were quite fun, too. Honestly, they're lovely to just put on and leave in the background while you do other things, too. I, I can't remember how many times I've been cleaning to that. <laughs> Why have we not an immortal soul? Asked the Little Mermaid mournfully. I would gladly give hundreds of years that I have to live to be a human being only for a day. And to have the hope of knowing that happiness of that glorious world above the stars. You must not think of that, said the old woman. We feel ourselves to be much happier and much better off than the human beings. So I shall die, and as the foam of the sea I shall be driven about never again to hear the music of the waves, or to see the pretty flowers, nor the red sun. Is there anything we can do to win an immortal soul? <laughs> oh dear, don't get Caffrey started on Pokemon, Darth. <laughs> no, said the old woman. Unless a man were to love you so much that you were more to him than his father or mother, and if all his thoughts and all his love were fixed upon you, and the priest placed his right hand in yours, and he promised to be true to you, and here and hereafter, then his soul would glide into your body, 
and you would obtain a share in the future happiness of mankind. He would give a soul to you and retain his own as well. But this can never happen. Your fish's tail, which amongst us is considered so beautiful, is not on earth to be quite ugly. They do not know any better, and they think it necessary to have two stout props, which they call legs, in order to be handsome. Then the little mermaid sighed and looked sorrowfully at her fish's tail. Let us be happy, said the old lady, and dot and spring about in the three hundred years that we have to live, which is really quite long enough. After that, we can rest ourselves all the better. This evening, we are going to have a court ball. It is one of those splendid sights which we can never see on earth. The walls and the ceiling of the large ballroom were thick, a transparent crystal. Many hundreds of colossal shells, some of a deep red, others of grass green, stood on each side in rows, with blue fire in them, which lighted up the whole saloon, and shone through the walls so that the sea was also illuminated. Innumerable fishes, great and small, swam past the crystal walls. On some of them the scales glowed with purple brilliancy, and on others they shone like silver and gold. Through the halls flowed a broad stream, and it danced in the mermen and the mermaids to the music of their own sweet singing. No one on earth has such a lovely voice as theirs. The little mermaid sang more sweetly than them all. The whole court applauded her with hands and tails, and for a moment her heart felt quite gay, for she knew she had the loveliest voice of any on the earth or in the sea. But she soon thought again of the world above her, for she could not forget the charming prince, nor her sorrow that she had not an immortal soul like his. Therefore she crept away silently out of her father's palace, and while everything within was gladness and song, she sat in her own little garden, sorrowful and alone. Then she heard the bugle sounding through the water and thought, He is certainly sailing above, he on whom my wishes depend, and in whose hands I should like to place the happiness of my life. I will venture all for him, and to win an immortal soul, while my sisters are dancing in my father's palace, I will go to the sea witch, of whom I have always been so afraid, but she can give me counsel and help. <laughs> All right, so Darth would say something to the effect of yeah, Or something to that effect, I suppose. And then the little mermaid went out from her garden and took the road to the forming whirlpools behind which the sorceress lived. She had never been that way before, neither flowers nor grass grew there, but bare, grey, sandy ground stretched out to the whirlpool, where the water, like foaming millweeds, whirled around everything it seized and cast it into the fathomless deep. <laughs> Through the midst of these crushing whirlpools, the little mermaid was obliged to pass, to reach the dominions of the sea witch, and also, for a long distance, the only road lay right across a quantity of warm, bubbling mire, called by the witch her turf moor. Beyond this stood her house in the center of a strange forest, in which all the trees and flowers were polypi, half animals and half plants. They looked like serpents with a hundred heads growing out of the ground. The branches were long, slimy arms, with fingers like flexible worms, moving limb after limb from the root to the top. All that could be reached in the sea they seized upon and held fast, so that it never escaped from their clutches. The little mermaid was so alarmed at what she saw that she stood still, and her heart beat with fear, and she was very nearly turning back. But she thought of the prince and the human soul for which she longed, and her courage returned. She fastened her long, flowing hair round her head, so that the polypi might not seize hold of it. She laid her hands together across her bosom, and then she darted forward as a fish shoots through the water, between the supple arms and fingers of the ugly polypi, which stretched out to each side of her. 
She saw that each held in its grasp something it had seized with its numerous little arms as if they were iron bands, the white skeletons of human beings who had perished at sea and sunk down into the water depths, skeletons of land animals, oars, rudders, and chests of ships were lying tightly grasped by their clinging arms, even a little mermaid whom they had caught and strangled, and this seemed the most shocking of all to the princess. She now came to a space of marshy ground in the wood, where fat water snakes were rolling in the mire and showing their ugly, drab-colored bodies. In the midst of this spot stood a house built with the bones of shipwrecked human beings. There sat the sea witch, allowing a toad to eat from her mouth, just as people sometimes feed a canary with a piece of sugar. She called the ugly water snakes her children and allowed them to crawl all over her bosom. I know what you want, said the sea witch. It is very stupid of you, but you shall have your way and it will bring you to sorrow, my pretty princess. You want to get rid of your fish's tail and to have two supports instead of it, like human beings on earth, so that the young prince may fall in love with you and that you may have an immortal soul. And then... The witch laughed so loud and disgustingly that the toad and the snakes fell to the ground and there lay wriggling about. <laughs> you are just in time, for after sunrise tomorrow I should not be able to help you till the end of another year. I will prepare a draught for you, which you must swim to land tomorrow before sunrise, and sit down on the shore and drink it. Your tail will then disappear and shrink up into what mankind calls legs. You will feel great pain as if a sword were passing through you. But all who see you will say that you are the prettiest little human being they ever saw. You will still have the same floating gracefulness of movement no dancer will ever tread so lightly. But at every step you take it will feel as if you are treading upon sharp knives and the blood must flow. If you will bear all this, I will help you. Yes, I will, said the little princess in a trembling voice, as she thought of the prince and the immortal soul. But think again, for when once your shape has become like a human being, you can no more be a mermaid. You will never return through the water to your sister's or to your father's palace again, and if you do not win the love of the prince so that he is willing to forget his father and mother for your sake and to love you with his whole soul and allow the priest to join your hands that you may be made man and wife, then you will never have an immortal soul. The first morning after he marries another, your heart will break and you will become foam on the crest of the waves. I will do it, said the little mermaid as she became as pale as death. <laughs> hmm, Star Wars seems to also be something that I remember Caffrey is fond of. It seems you two will get along quite famously. <laughs> but I must be paid also, said the witch, and it is not a trifle, I ask. You have the sweetest voice of any who dwell down here in the depths of the sea, and you believe that you will be able to charm the prince with it also, but this voice you must give to me. The best thing you possess will I have for the price of my draughts. My own blood must be mixed with it, that it may be as sharp as a two-edged sword. But if you take away my voice, what is left for me? Your beautiful form, your graceful walk, and your expressive eyes. Surely with these you can enchain a man's heart. Well, have you lost your courage? Put out your little tongue that I may cut it off as payment, and then you shall have the powerful draught. It shall be, said the little mermaid. <laughs> sea Witch, yes. I think it was specifically Disney that came up with that name for it, Caffrey. Then the witch placed her cauldron on the fire to prepare the magic draught. Friendliness is a good thing, she said, scouring the vessel with snakes, which she had tied together in a large knot. Then she pricked herself in the breast and let a black blood drop into it. 
The steam that rose formed itself into such horrible shapes that no one could ever look at them without fear. Every moment the witch threw something else into the vessel, and when it began to boil, the sound was like the weeping of a crocodile. When at last the magic draught was ready, it looked like the clearest water. "'There it is for you,' said the sea witch. Then she cut off the mermaid's tongue so that she became dumb and would never speak again or sing. "'If the polypy should seize hold of you as you return through the woods, owe them a few drops of the potion, and their fingers will be torn to a thousand pieces.' But the little mermaid had no occasion to do this, for the polypy sprang back in terror when they caught sight of the glittering draught, which shone in her hand like a twinkling star. So she passed quickly through the woods and the marsh, and between the rushing whirlpools. She saw that in her father's palace the torches in the ballroom were extinguished, and all within were asleep, but she did not venture to go into them, for she was dumb and going to leave them forever. She felt as if her heart would break. She stole into the garden, took a flower from the flower beds of each of her sisters, kissed her hand a thousand times toward the palace, and then rose up through the dark blue waters. The sun had not risen when she came in sight of the prince's palace, and had approached the beautiful marble steps, but the moon shone clear and bright, and the little mermaid drank the draught, and it seemed as if a two-edged sword went through her delicate body. She fell into a swoon and lay like one who is dead. When the sun arose and shone over the sea, she recovered and felt a sharp pain, but just before her stood the handsome young prince. He fixed his coal-black eyes upon her so earnestly that she cast down her own, and then became aware that her fish's tail was gone, and that she had a pretty pair of white legs and tiny feet, as little as any maiden could have. But she had no clothes, so she wrapped herself in her long, thick hair. The prince asked who she was and where she had come from, and she looked at him mildly and sorrowfully with her deep blue eyes, but she could not speak. Every step she took was the, as the witch had said it would be. She felt as if treading upon the points of needles or sharp knives, but she bore it willingly and stepped as lightly by the prince's side as a soap bubble, so that he and all who saw her wondered at her graceful swaying movements. She was very soon arrayed in costly robes of silk and muslin, and was the most beautiful creature in the palace, but she was dumb and could neither speak nor sing. Hmm. Beautiful female slaves, dressed in silk and gold, stepped forward and sang before the prince and his royal parents. One sang better than all the others, and the prince clapped his hands and smiled at her. This was great sorrow to the little mermaid. She knew how much more sweetly she herself could sing once, and she thought, Oh, if only, if he could only know that, I have given away my voice forever to be with him. <laughs> the slaves next performed some pretty fairy-like dances to the sound of beautiful music. Then the little mermaid raised her lovely white arms, stood on the tips of her toes, and glided over the floor and danced, as no one yet had been able to dance. At each moment, her beauty became more revealed, and her expressive eyes appealed more directly to the heart than the songs of the slaves. Everyone was enchanted, especially the prince, who called her his little foundling, and she danced again quite readily to please him, though each time her foot touched the floor it seemed as if she trod upon sharp knives. The prince said she should remain with him always, and she received permission to sleep at his door on a velvet cushion. He had a page's dress made for her that she might accompany him on horseback. They rode together through the sweet-scented woods, where the green boughs touched their shoulders, and the little birds sang among the fresh leaves. She climbed with the prince to the tops of the high mountains, and although her tender feet bled so that even her steps were marked, she only laughed and followed him so they could see the clouds beneath them looking like a flock of birds traveling to distant lands. While at the prince's palace, and when all the household were asleep, she would go and sit on the broad marble steps, 
for it eased her burning feet to bathe them in the cold seawater, and then she thought of all those below in the deep. Once during the night, her sisters came up arm in arm, singing sorrowfully as they floated on the water. She beckoned to them, and then they recognized her and told her how she had grieved them. After that, they came to the same place every night, and once she saw in the distance her old grandmother, who had not been to the surface of the sea for many years, and the old sea king, her father, with his crown on his head. They stretch out their hands toward her, but they did not venture so near the land as her sisters did. As the days passed, she loved the prince more fondly, and he loved her as he would love a little child, but it never came into his head to make her his wife. Yet, unless he married her, she could not receive an immortal soul, and on the morning after his marriage with another, she would dissolve into the foam of the sea. Do you not love me, the best of them all? The eyes of the little mermaid seemed to say when he looked, took her in his arms and kissed her fair forehead. Yes, you are dear to me, said the prince, for you have the best heart. You are the most devoted to me. You are like a young maiden whom I once saw, but whom I shall never meet again. I was in a ship that was wrecked, and the waves cast me ashore near a holy temple, where several young maidens performed the service. The youngest of them found me on the shore and saved my life. I saw her but twice, and she is the only one in the world for whom I could love. But you are like her, and you have almost driven the image out of my mind. She belongs to the holy temple, and my good fortune has sent you to me instead of her, and we will never part. Oh, he knows not that it was I who saved his life, thought the little mermaid. I carried him over the sea to the wood where the temple stands. I sat beneath the foam and watched till the human beings came to help him. I saw the pretty maiden that he loves better than he loves me. And the mermaid sighed deeply, but she could not shed tears. He says the maiden belongs to the holy temple, therefore she will never return to the world. They will meet no more, while I am by his side and see him every day. I will take care of him and love him and give up my life for his sake. Very soon it was that the prince must marry, and that the beautiful daughter of a neighboring king would be his wife, for a fine ship was being fitted out. Although the prince gave out that he merely intended to pay a visit to the king, it was generally supposed that he really went to see his daughter. A great company were to go with him, the little mermaid smiled and shook her head. She knew the prince's thoughts better than any of the others. I must travel, he said to her. I must see this beautiful princess, my parents desire it, but they will not oblige me to bring her home as my bride. I cannot love her. She is not like the beautiful maiden in the temple whom you resemble. If I were forced to choose a bride, I would rather choose you, my dumb foundling, with those expressive eyes. And then he kissed her rosy mouth, played with her long waving hair, and laid his head out on her heart's while she dreamed of human happiness and an immortal soul. "'You are not afraid of the sea, my dumb child,' said he as they stood on the deck of the noble ship which was to carry them to the country of the neighboring king. And then he told her of storm and of calm, of strange fishes in the de deep beneath them, and of what the divers had seen there. And she smiled at his descriptions, for she knew better than anyone what wonders lay at the bottom of the sea." In the moonlight, when all on board were asleep, excepting the man at the helm, who was steering, she sat on the deck, gazing down through the clear water. She thought she could distinguish her father's castle, and upon it her aged grandmother, with her silver crown on her head, looking through the rushing tide at the keel of the vessel. Then her sisters came up on the waves and gazed at her mournfully, wringing their white hands. She beckoned to them, and smiled, and wanted to tell them how happy she, and well off she was. But the cabin boy approached, and when her sisters dived down, he thought it was only the foam of the sea which he saw. The next morning the ship sailed into the harbor of a beautiful town belonging to the king whom the prince was going to visit. 
the church bells were ringing and from the high towers sounded a flourish of trumpets and soldiers with flying colors and glittering bayonets lined the rocks through which they passed every day was a festival balls and entertainments followed one after another but the princess had not yet appeared people said that she was being brought up and educated in a religious house where she was learning every royal virtue at last she came then the little mermaid who was very anxious to see whether she was really beautiful was obliged to acknowledge that she had never seen a more perfect vision of beauty her skin was delicately fair and beneath her long dark eyelashes her laughing blue eyes shone with truth and purity it was you said the prince who saved my life when i lay dead on the beach he folded his blushing bride in his arms oh i am too happy said he to the little mermaid my fondest hopes are all fulfilled you rejoice at my happiness for your devotion to me is great and sincere the little mermaid kissed his hand and felt as if her heart were already broken his wedding morning would bring death to her and she would change into the foam of the sea all the church bells rung and the heralds rode about the town proclaiming the betrothal perfumed oil was burning in costly silver lamps on every altar the priest waved the censers while the bride and bridegroom joined their hands and received the blessings of the bishop the little mermaid dressed in silk and gold held up the bride's train but her ears heard nothing of the festive music and her eyes saw not the holy ceremony she thought of the night of death which was coming to her of all she had lost in the world on the same evening the bride and bridegroom went on board ship cannons were roaring flags waving and in the center of the ship a costly tent of purple and gold had been erected it contained elegant couches for the reception of the bridal pair during the night the ship with swelling sails and a favorable wind glided away smoothly and calmly over the calm sea when it grew dark a number of colored lamps were lit and the sailors danced merrily on the deck the little mermaid could not help thinking of her first rising out of the sea when she had seen similar festivities and joys when she joined in the dance poised herself in the air as a swallow when he pursues his prey and all present cheered with wonder she had never danced so elegantly before her tender feet felt as if cut with sharp knives but she cared not for it a sharper pang had pierced her heart she knew this was the last evening she should ever see the prince for whom she had forsaken her kindred and her home she had given up her beautiful voice and suffered unheard of pain daily for him while he knew nothing of it this was the last evening that she would breathe the same air as him or gaze into the starry skies and the deep sea an eternal night without a thought or dream awaited her she had no soul and now she could never win one all was joy and gaiety on board the ship till long after midnight she laughed and danced with the rest while the thoughts of death were in her heart the prince kissed his beautiful bride while she played with his raven hair till they were arm in arm to rest in the splendid tent then all became still on the board the ship the helmsman alone awake stood at the helm the little mermaid leaned her white arms on the edge of the vessel and looked toward the east the first blush of morning for the first ray of dawn that would bring her death she saw her sisters rising out of the flood they were as pale as herself but their long beautiful hair waved no more in the wind and had been cut off We have given her hair to the witch to obtain help for you that you might not die tonight she has given us a knife here it is see it is the very sharp before the sun rises you must plunge it into the heart of the prince when the warm blood falls upon your feet they will grow together again and form into a fish's tail and you will be once more a mermaid and return to us to live out your three hundred years before you die and change into salt sea foam haste then 
he or you must die before sunrise our old grandmother moans for you so that her white hair is falling out from sorrow as ours fell under the witch's scissors kill the prince and come back hasten do you not see the first red streaks in the sky in a few minutes the sun will rise and you must die and then they sighed deeply and mournfully and sank down beneath the waves Jeffrey, those characters were very much creations of Disney. And yes, she did watch the man that she loves get married to someone else. The little mermaid drew back the crimson curtain of the tent and beheld the fair bride with her head resting on the prince's breast. She bent down and kissed his fair brow and looked at the sky on which the rosy dawn grew brighter and brighter. Then she glanced at the sharp knife and again fixed her eyes on the prince, who whispered the name of his bride in his dreams. She was in his thoughts, and the knife trembled in the hand of the little mermaid. Then she flung it far away into the waves. The water turned red where it fell, and the drops that splurted up looked like blood. She cast one more lingering, half-fainting glance at the prince, and threw herself from the ship into the sea, and thought her body was dissolving into foam. The sun rose above the waves, and his warm rays fell on the cold foam of the little mermaid, who did not feel as if she were dying. She saw the bright sun, and all around her floated hundreds of transparent, beautiful beings. She could see through them the white sails of the ship and the red clouds in the sky. Their speech was melodious, but too ethereal to be heard by mortal ears as they were also unseen by mortal eyes. The little mermaid perceived that she had a body like theirs, and that she continued to rise higher and higher out of the foam. Where am I? asked she, and her voice sounded ethereal as the voice of those who were with her. No earthly music could imitate it. Among the daughters of air, answered one of them, a mermaid has not an immortal soul, nor can she obtain one unless she lends the love of a human being. On the power of another hangs her eternal destiny. But the daughters of the air, though they do not possess an immortal soul, can by their good deeds procure one for themselves. We fly to warm countries to cool the sultry air that destroys mankind with pestilence. We carry the perfume of the flowers to spread health and restoration. After we have striven for three hundred years, to all the good in our power, we receive an immortal soul and take part in the happiness of mankind. You, poor little mermaid, have tried with your whole heart to do as we are doing. You have suffered and endured and raised yourself to the spirit world by your good deeds. And now, by striving for three hundred years in the same way, you may obtain an immortal soul. <laughs> Those sound like quite the fun stuffed animal names, Darth. The little mermaid lifted her glorified eyes toward the sun and felt them, for the first time, filling with tears. On the ship in which she had left the prince, there were life and noise. She saw him as his beautiful bride searching for her. Sorrowfully they gazed upon uh, the peely foam as if they knew she had thrown herself into the waves. Unseen, she kissed the forehead of the bride and fanned the prince, and then mounted with other children of the air to a rosy cloud that floated through the ether. After three hundred years, thus shall we float into the kingdom of heaven, said she. And we may even get there sooner, whispered one of the companions. Unseen, we can enter the houses of men where there are children, and for every day on which we find a good child, who is the joy of his parents and deserves their love, our time of probation is shortened. The child does not know, when we fly through the room, that we smile with joy at his good conduct, for we can count one year less of our three hundred years. But when we see a naughty or wicked child, we shed tears of sorrow 
and for every tear a day is added to our time of trial. Ooh, that was... I expected the sea foam part, that's commonly known. I did not know the children of the air part. And honestly, I find it kind of encouraging. Um, Hans Christian Andersen is a fantastic author, and I expected this to end very similarly to The Little Match Girl, which, whew, that one's a very different uh, <laughs> sort of... Um, it doesn't end so nicely. But I, I like the portrayal here partly because I know that Anderson's story is popularly expected to be about his own longing for a man that he was quite close with. Um, in the time that he lived, it was very common for men to have a very close male companion and for women to have a very close female companion uh, that they would sort of practice being lovers on. So like they kiss each other, they'd hold hands, go on dates, all the kinds of things that you expect to do as part of like your later married life, but with someone of the same gender. And it was even tradition on your wedding to uh, get, send like long poems lamenting the fate that had to come before you because you were parting with this person. Um, and it just... It was one of Mr. Anderson's companions that this book was thought to be directed toward. Um, really, in many ways, a repression of his own homosexual feelings. Um, Anderson himself never married, never took a partner. Um, instead, he dedicated his life to writing stories that would become for children. And as a result, he eventually became a national treasure of Denmark. Venny, good to see you. Thank you so much for dropping in. Um, <laughs> you're not wrong that, uh, yeah, it, it's, it's impressive that Disney took a look at this and went, yeah, we can do a modern kids movie with this. Um, but yes, during his lifetime, uh, Hans Christian Andersen was declared a national treasure of Denmark, and his basic livelihood was provided for so that he could continue writing fantastic children's stories. Um, <laughs> and today there is a statue of the Little Mermaid in Copenhagen. Um, so that's... If I get a chance to travel to Copenhagen, that is one of the things that I do rather anxiously want to see. But I like this addition piece here that with the spirit or the children of the air, because it really plays less than into this tragedy of losing your love, and also incorporates finding a real purpose in spreading good and truth and charity throughout the world. <laughs> Uh, yeah, and you're right. It, it's not just one movie with terrible content. <laughs> Cinderella is a dark story. Um, although Cinderella also does have a happy ending, despite having some feet cut off as part of the process. Um, wow, we, we finished this one much earlier than I expected, too. Um, I thought this was supposed to be similar in length to The Snow Queen, which is yeah, that, that takes several hours to get through. I actually haven't read all of the Snow Queen previously. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, though, um, thank you everybody for staying with me through this story. Um, also... Let me make sure that this is the person I think it is. Oh, yep, absolutely. So for those not familiar with Venny, um, absolutely adorable. Um, Venny has... Uh, I actually encountered Venny through a Pokemon stream that uh, Easily Bored and I were doing. Um, but I, I've seen Venny's content. It's usually pretty fun. Um, 
I, I've seen a fair amount of Dead by Daylight more recently, but um, if you get a chance, I do strongly recommend Venny um, as just a really, a very calming, a very enjoyable uh, content creator. <laughs> Um, and yes, Hunchback of Notre Dame is a very dark book. Um... <laughs> then he forgot the thing that I actually followed for initially. <laughs> oh, that's delightful. Uh, yes, if you ever get back to that Pokemon run, I would be interested in seeing where it goes too, Venny. <laughs> Oh my, um, but no, so, um, on that subject then, um, we might as well do a little bit of a poll here, because we've got plenty of time left in stream. So let's put a poll out for which book should we read next. So... So we'll set this for about three minutes here. Um, Snow Queen, Cinderella, was there anything else that people would like to see here? Well, we'll start the poll with this. So, um, you might have to tap out of your uh, entry box if you're watching on mobile, but there is now a poll that will be for which book to read next. And I strongly encourage people to uh, pick one of them. Um, I've also left it open to using points to manipulate the vote. Um, I think that's always a fun thing to do if we can. So if people are passionate about it, you're more than welcome to use my owl tokens to uh, influence the vote just a little bit. Um, looks like the Snow Queen is currently in the lead here. And I'm glad you won't argue with me about the shoutout, Fenny, because you don't really get much of a choice in the matter. <laughs> I, I think I have seen you play some Destiny before. Um, although I don't necessarily understands destiny very well so <laughs> uh all the same um so while that poll runs oh wow the snow queen seems to be a very popular choice for tonight i guess we have some hans christian anderson fans <laughs> um <laughs> Didn't know how to fly. <laughs> A sword and ice flower, ice powers to fly. That that almost sounds poetic. Give me a sword. Give me ice powers. I shall fly and they shall fall. I am the undoing of the foul, the unjust, and the generally maladapted. Or something like that. <laughs> All right. <laughs> 36 votes. Somebody's manipulating. <laughs> oh, dear. <laughs> I think I better get the Snow Queen loaded up here. <laughs> There's not really a competition. <laughs> All right. Um, let's see. I should probably do this in a... Uh, place where you'll don't have to watch me uh doing it in that but mm. Yes, Caffrey, I did deliberately turn the points on. I figure if people want to use their points for manipulating the votes, especially since, like, 
Most of my redeems are probably not the most interesting things, although I am surprised I haven't seen any hydrate redeems come across. Um, but not everybody is going to enjoy the things that the points do. 30 points! <laughs> I think Benny enthusiastically wants this. Oh dear. All right, let me get this loaded up here. Uh, and then I need to add the attribution in. So uh, because we're pulling the text from Wikipedia here in order to have those nice pictures, um, I do need to make sure that I'm properly attributing that, so that's going to take me just a moment to update my, uh, my little attribution piece here. So hopefully people can read that okay. Um, and yes, I, I keep the story up so that you can follow along as I read. Um. <laughs> so much Star Wars talk in my chat, I don't know what to make of it. <laughs> oh, and there's somebody redeeming a hydrate. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, Kefri. <laughs> All right. So with that, let's move into the Snow Queen. In seven stories. We're not finishing this tonight, <laughs> but that's okay. Oh, Venny, it... it Honestly, I'm convinced the cat had gone chaotic since about two-thirds of the way through The Little Mermaid. <laughs> Kefri and Darth here found that they both like Pokemon and Star Wars, and the result was inevitable. <laughs> you had me at in, I'm out? Oh, okay. Story the first which describes a looking glass and the broken fragments. You must attend to the commencement of this story, for when we get to the end we shall know more than we do now about the very wicked Hobgoblin. He was one of the very worst, for he was a real demon. One day, when he was in a merry mood, he made a looking glass which had the power of making everything good or beautiful that was reflected in it almost shrink to nothing, while everything that was worthless and bad looked increased in size and worse than ever. The most lovely landscapes appeared like boiled spinach, and the, uh, and the people became hideous and looked as if they stood on their heads and had no bodies. Their countenances were so distorted that one no one could recognize them, and even one freckle on the face appeared to spread over the whole of the nose and mouth. <laughs> no, uh, looking through the looking glass is the second of the Alice in Wonderland books, Kefri. That that's a very different thing. <laughs> but we can certainly do through the looking glass one of these nights if the mood strikes everyone. Their consciences were stood. Ah, yes. The demon said this was very amusing. When a good or pious thought passed through the mind of anyone, it was misinterpreted in the glass, and then how the demon laughed at his cunning invention. All who went to the demon's school, for he kept a school, talked everywhere of the wonders they had seen and declared that people could now, for the first time, see what the world and mankind were really like. They carried the glass about everywhere, till at last there was not land nor people who had not been looked at through this distorted mirror. 
Jeffrey's comment about Pikachu. I, uh... I'm not touching that. <laughs> oh, they carried the glass... Uh, yes. Uh, they wanted even to fly with it up to heaven to see the angels. But the higher they flew, the more slippery the glass became, and they could scarcely hold it. So at last it slipped from their hands, fell to the earth, and was broken into millions of pieces. But now the looking glass caused more unhappiness than ever, for some of the fragments were not so large as a grain of sand, and they flew about the world into every country. When one of these tiny atoms flew into a person's eye, it stuck there unknown to him, and from that moment he saw everything through a distorted medium, or could only see the worst side of what he looked at, for even the smallest fragment retained the same power which had belonged to the whole mirror. Some few persons even got a fragment of the looking glass in their hearts, and this was very terrible, for their hearts became cold like a lump of ice. A few of the pieces were so large that they could be used as window panes, if one would have such a sad thing to look at our friends through them. Other pieces were made into spectacles. This was dreadful for those who wore them, for they could see nothing either rightly or justly. At all this, the wicked demon laughed till his sides shook. It tickled him so to see the mischief he had done. There were a number still of these little fragments of glass floating about in the air, and now you shall hear what happened to one of them. Oh no, you lost your Pokemon save. I'm sorry to hear it, Venny. The second story, a little boy and a little girl. In a large town full of houses and people, there is not room for everybody to have even a little garden. Therefore, they are obliged to be satisfied with a few flowers and flower pots. In one of these large towns lived two poor children who had to garden something larger and better than a few flower pot. Er, they were not brother and sister, but they loved each other almost as much as if they had been. Their parents lived opposite each other in two garrets, where the roofs of neighboring houses projected out toward each other, and the water pipe ran between them. In each house was a little window, so that anyone could see step across the gutter from one window to the other. The parents of these children had a large wooden box in which they cultivated kitchen herbs for their own use, and a little rose bush in each box which grew splendidly. Now after a while, the parents decided to place these two boxes across the water pipe so that they reached from one window to the other and looked like two banks of flowers. Sweet peas, dropped over the boxes, and the rose bushes shot forth long branches which were trained round the windows and clustered together almost like a triumphal arch of leaves and flowers. The boxes were very high, and the children knew they must not climb upon them without permission, but they were often, however, allowed to step out together and sit upon their little stools under the rose bushes or play quietly. Oh, I should probably fix this real quick here. There we are. That's better. All right. So they were allowed to sit on their little stools. In the winter, all this pleasure came to an end, for the windows were sometimes quite frozen over. But then they would warm copper pennies on the stove and hold the warm pennies against the frozen pane. There would be very soon a little round hole through which they could peep, and the soft bright eyes of the little boy and little girl would beam through the hole at each other as they looked at each other. Their names were Kay and Gerda. In summer they could be seen together with one jump from the window, but in winter they had to go up and down the long staircase and out through the snow before they could meet. See, there are see there are the white bees swarming. 
Oh. Kay's old grandmother. See, there are the white bees swarming, said Kay's old grandmother one day when it was snowing. Have they a queen bee? asked the little boy, for he knew that real bees always had a queen. To be sure they have, said the grandmother. She's flying there where the swarm is the thickest. She is the largest of them all, and never remains on the earth, but flies up to the dark clouds. Often at night, midnight, she flies through the streets of the town and looks in at the windows, and then the ice freezes in the panes into wonderful shapes that look like clouds and castles. Yes, I have seen them, said both the children, and they knew it must be true. Can the Snow Queen come in here? Only let her come. I'll set her on the stove and then she'll melt. Then the grandmother smoothed his hair and told him some more tales. One evening, when little Kay was at home, half undressed, he climbed on a chair by the window and peeped out through the hole. A few flakes of snow were falling and one of them, rather larger than the rest, alighted on the edge of one of the flower boxes. The snowflake grew larger and larger till at last it became the figure of a woman, dressed in garments of white gauze, which looked like millions of starry snowflakes linked together. She was fair and beautiful, but made of ice, shining and glittering ice. Still, she was alive, and her eyes sparkled like bright stars, but there was neither peace nor rest in their glance. She nodded toward the window and waved her hand, the little boy was frightened and sprang from his chair. At the same moment, it seemed as if a large bird flew by the window. On the following day, there was clear frost, and very soon came the spring. The sun shone, the young green leaves burst forth, the swallows built their nests, the windows were opened, and the children sat once more in the garden of the roof, high above all the other rooms. How beautifully the roses blossomed in the summer! The little girl had learned to him in which roses were spoken of, and she thought of her own roses, and she sang the hymn to the little boy, and he sang too. Roses bloom and cease to be, but we shall the Christ child see. Then the little ones held each other by the hand and kissed the roses, and looked at the bright sunshine and spoke to it as if the Christ child were there. Those were splendid summer days. How beautiful and fresh it was out among the rose bushes, which seemed as if they would never leave off blooming. One day, Kay and Gerda sat looking at a box, book full of pictures of animals and birds. And then, just as the clock in the church showers struck twelve, Kay said, Oh, something has struck my heart. And soon after, There's something in my eye. The little girl put her arm around his neck and looked into his eye, but she could see nothing. I think it is gone, he said, but it was not gone. It was one of those bits of the looking glass, that magic mirror of which we have spoken, the ugly glass which made everything great and good appear small and ugly, while all that was wicked and bad became more visible, and every little fault could be plainly seen. Poor little Kay had also received a small grain in his heart, which quickly turned to a lump of ice. He felt no more pain. The glass was there still. Why do you cry? It makes you look ugly, said he. There's nothing the matter with me now. Oh, see, he cried suddenly. That rose is worm-eaten, and this one is quite crooked. After all, they are ugly roses, just like the box in which they stand. And then he kicked the boxes with his foot and pulled off two of the two roses. <laughs> Nicely done, Kefri. Hey, what are you doing? cried the little girl. And then, when he saw how frightened she was, he tore off another rose and jumped through his own window away from sweet little Gerda. When she afterward brought out the picture book, he said, It was only fit for babies in long clothes. And when Grandmother told any stories, he would interrupt her with, But... Or when he could manage it, he would get behind her chair, put on a pair of spectacles, and imitate her very cleverly to make people laugh. 
by and by he began to mimic the speech and gait of persons in the street all that was peculiar or disagreeable in a person he would imitate directly and people said oh that boy would be very clever he has a remarkable genius but it was the piece of glass in his eye and the coldness in his heart that made him act like this he would even tease little gerda who loved him with all her heart his games too were quite different they were not so childish one winter's day, when it snowed, he brought out a burning glass. Then he held out the tail of his blue coat and let snowflakes fall upon it. Look in the glass, Gerda, said he, and she saw how every flake of snow was magnified and looked like a beautiful flower or a glittering star. Is it not clever, said Kay, and much more interesting than looking at real flowers? There's not a single fault in it. And the snowflakes are quite perfect, at least until they begin to melt. Soon after, Kay made his appearance in large, thick gloves and with his sledge at his back. He called upstairs to Gerda. I've got to go into the great square where the other boys play and ride. And away he went. And as Darth put it, GG Mon. Digital monsters, Digimon, or the chair. No, never mind. That's not at all what Darth put. <laughs> In the great square, the boldest among the boys would often tie their sledges to other pe country people's carts and go with them a good way. And this was capital. But while they were all amusing themselves and Kay with them, a great sledge came by. It was painted white, and in it sat someone wrapped in rough white fur and wearing a white cap. The sledge drove twice round the square, and Kay fastened his own little sledge to it, so that when it went away, he followed with it. It went faster and faster right through the next street, and then the person who drove turned round and nodded pleasantly to Kay, just as if they were acquainted with each other. But whenever Kay wished to loosen his little sledge, the driver nodded again, so Kay sat still, and they drove out through the town gate. Then the snow began to fall so heavily that the little boy could not see a hand's breadth before him, but still they drove on. Then he suddenly loosened the cord so that the large sledge might go on without him, but it was of no use. His little carriage held fast, and away they went like the wind. Then he called out loudly, but nobody heard him while the snow beat upon him, and the sledge flew onwards. Every now and then it gave a jump as if it were going over hedges and ditches, Boy was frightened and tried to say a prayer, but he could remember nothing but the multiplication table. The snowflakes became larger and larger till they appeared like great white chickens. All at once they sprang up on one side, the great sledge stopped, and the person who had driven it rose up. The fur and the cap, which were made entirely out of snow, fell off, and he saw a lady, tall and white. It was the Snow Queen. We have driven well, said she. But why do you tremble? Here, creep into my warm fur. Then she seated him beside her in the sledge, and she wrapped the fur around him as he felt as if he were sinking into a snowdrift. Are you still cold? she asked as she kissed him on the forehead. The kiss was colder than ice. It went quite through to his heart, which was already almost a lump of ice. He felt as if he were going to die, but only for a moment. He soon seemed quite well again, and did not notice the cold all around him. Uh, my sledge! Don't forget my sledge! was his first thought, and then he looked and saw that it was bound fast to one of the white chickens which flew behind him with the sledge at his back. The Snow Queen kissed little Kay again, and by this time he had forgotten little Gerda, his grandmother, and all at home. Now you must have no more kisses, or I should kiss you to death. Kay looked at her and saw that she was so beautiful, he could not imagine a more intelligent and lovely face. She did not now seem to be made of ice, as when he had seen her through his window, and she had nodded to him. In his eyes, she was perfect, and he did not at all feel afraid. He told her he could do mental arithmetic as far as fractions, and that he knew number of square miles and the number of inhabitants in the country she always smiled so that he thought he did not know yet enough yet, and looked round at the vast expanse as she flew higher and higher with him upon a black cloud, 
while the storm blew and howled as if it were singing old songs. They flew over woods and lakes, over sea and land. Below them roared the wild wind. The wolves howled and the snow crackled. Over them flew the black screaming crows, and above all shone the moon, clear and bright. And so Kay passed through the long winter's night, and by day he slept at the feet of the Snow Queen. <laughs> oh. Ah. I find it absolutely adorable that my chat's just been going on about Digimon this bit here. <laughs> oh, I, I, I need to talk to all of you outside of stream too, <laughs> just to just to be able to enjoy some of this with you. Mm. The flower garden of the woman who could conjure. But how fared little Gerda during Kay's absence? What had become of him, no one knew, nor could anyone give the slightest information, excepting the boys who said that he had tied his sledge to another very large one, which had driven through the street and out at the town gate. Nobody knew where it went. Many tears were shed for him, and little Gerda wept bitterly for a long time. She said she knew he must be dead, but he drowned in the river which flowed close by the school. Oh, indeed, those long winter days were very dreary, but at last spring came with warm sunshine. Kay is dead and gone, said little Gerda. I don't believe it, said the sunshine. He is dead and gone, she said to the sparrows. We don't believe it, they replied. And at last little Gerda began to doubt it herself. I will put on my new red shoes, those that Kay has never seen, and then I will go down to the river and ask him for help. It was quite early when she kissed her old grandmother, who was still asleep. Then she put on her red shoes and went quietly alone to, out of the town gates toward the river. Is it true that you have taken my little playmate away from me? I will give you my red shoes if you will give him back to me, Gerda asked the river. And it seemed as if the waves nodded to her in a strange manner. Then she took off her red shoes, which she liked better than anything else, and threw them both into the river. But they fell near the bank, and the little waves carried them back to land, just as if the river would not take from her what she loved best, because they could not give her back her little Kay. But she thought the shoes had not been thrown out far enough. Then she crept into a boat that lay among the reeds and threw the shoes again farther from the, the end of the boat into the water, but it was not fastened, and her movement sent it sliding away from land. When she saw this, she hastened to reach the end of the boat, but before she could do so, it was more than a yard from the bank and drifting away faster than ever. Then, little Gerda was very much frightened and began to cry, but no one had heard her except the sparrows, and they could not carry her to land, but they flew along by the shore and sang as if to comfort her, here we are! Here we are! The boat floated with the stream. Little Gerda sat quite still with only her stockings on her feet. The red shoes floated after her, but she could not reach them because the boat kept so much in advance. The banks on each side of the river were very pretty. There were beautiful flowers, old trees, sloping fields in which the cows and sheep were grazing, but not a man to be seen. Perhaps the river will carry me to little Kay thought Gerda, and then she became more cheerful and raised her head and looked at the beautiful green banks, and so the boat sailed on for hours. At length she came to a large cherry orchard, in which stood a house with strange red and blue windows. It also had a thatched roof, and outside were two wooden soldiers that presented their arms to her as she sailed past. <laughs> oh no, I'm sorry for the echo, Caffrey. Um, I, I really do need to find a way to improve my soundproofing once I can afford to do so. Gerda called out to the soldiers, for she thought they were alive, 
but of course they did not answer, and as the boat drifted nearer to the shore, she saw what they really were. Then Gerda called still louder, and there came a very old woman out of the house, leaning on a crutch. She wore a large hat to shade her from the sun, and on it were painted all sorts of pretty flowers. "'You poor child,' said the old woman. "'How did you manage to come all this distance into the wide world on such a rapid rolling stream?' And then the old woman walked into the water, seized the boat with her crutch, drew it to land, and lifted little Gerda out. And Gerda was glad to feel herself on dry ground again although she was rather afraid of the strange old woman. "'Come and tell me who you are and how you came to be here.' Mm. <laughs> "'Oh no, I'm making everybody jump, it seems.' Then Gerda told her everything, while the old woman shook her head and said, "'Hmm, hmm.' And when she had finished, Gerda asked if she had not seen little Kay, and the old woman told her she had, that he had not passed by that way, but he very likely would come. So she told Gerda not to be sorrowful, but to hate, taste the cherries and look at the flowers. They were better than any picture book, for each of them could tell a story. Then she took Gerda by the hand and led her into the little house, and the old woman closed the door. The windows were very high, and as the panes were red, blue, and yellow, the daylight shone through them in all sorts of singular colors. On the table stood some beautiful cherries, and Gerda had permission to eat as many as she would. While she was eating them, the old woman combed out her long flaxen ringlets with a golden comb, and the glossy curls hung down each side of the little round pleasant face, which looked fresh and blooming as a rose. I have long been wishing for a little dear maiden like you, said the old woman, and now you must stay with me and see how happily we shall live together. And while she went on combing little Gerda's hair, she felt less and less about her adopted brother Kay, for the old woman could conjure, although she was not a wicked witch, she conjured only a little for her own amusement, and now because she wanted to keep Gerda. Therefore she went into the garden and stretched out her crutch toward all the rose trees, beautiful though they were, and immediately they sunk down into the earth, so that no one could tell where they had once stood. The old woman was afraid that if little Gerda saw the roses, she would think of those at home and remember little Kay, and run away. Then she took Gerda into the flower garden. How fragrant and beautiful it was! Every flower that could be thought of for every season of the year was here in full bloom. No picture book could have been have more beautiful colors. Gerda jumped for joy and played till the sun went down behind the tall cherry trees. Then she slept in an elegant bed with red silk pillows embroidered with colored velvets. And then she dreamt as pleasantly as a queen on her wedding day. The next day, and for many days after... Gerda played with the flowers in the warm sunshine. She knew every flower, and yet, although there were so many of them, it seemed as if one were missing, but she could not tell. One day, however, she sat looking at the old woman's hat with the painted flowers on it. She saw the prettiest of them all was a rose. The old woman had forgotten to take it from her hat when she made all those roses sink into the earth. But it is difficult to keep the thoughts together and everything. One little mistake upsets all our arrangements. Oh. Oh, what? Are there no roses here? cried Gerda, and she ran out into the garden and examined all the beds and searched and searched. There was not a one to be found. Then she sat down and wept, and her tears fell just on the place where one of the rose trees had sunk down. The warm tears moistened the earth, and the rose tree sprouted up at once, as blooming as when it had sunk, and Gerda embraced it and kissed the roses, and thought of the beautiful roses at home, and with them of little Kay. "'Oh, how I have been detained!' said the little maiden. 
I wanted to seek for little Kay. Do you know where he is? She asked the roses. Do you think he is dead? And the roses answered, No, he is not dead. We have been in the ground where the, all the dead lie, but Kay is not there. Thank you, said little Gerda. And then she went to the other flowers and looked into their little cups and asked, Do you know where little Kay is? But each flower, as it stood in the sunshine, dreamed of its own little fairy tale or history. Not one knew anything of Kay. Gerda heard many stories from the flowers as she asked each one of them about him, one after another. And what of the tiger lily? Hark, do you hear the drum? Tum tum. There are only two notes always, tum tum. Listen to the women's song of morning, hear the cry of the priest. In her long red robe stands the Hindu widow by the funeral pile. The flames rise around her as she places herself on the dead body of her husband, but the Hindu woman is thinking of the living one in that circle, of him, her son, who lighted those flames, those shining eyes trouble her heart more painfully than the flames which will soon consume her body to ashes. Can the fire of the heart be extinguished in the flames of a funeral pile? I don't understand that at all. That is my story, said the tiger lily. What says the convolvus? Er, uh, convolvulus? E yonder window, narrow road, stands an old knight's castle. Thick ivy creeps over the old ruined walls, leaf over leaf, even to the balcony in which stands a beautiful maiden. She bends over the balustrades and looks up the road. No rose on its stem is fresher than she, no apple blossom wafted by the wind and floats more lightly than she moves. Her rich silk rustles as she bends over and exclaims, Will he not come? Is it Kay, you mean? I am only speaking of a story of my dream, replied the flower. <laughs> I don't know if Tiger Lily was a character in Peter Pan. I haven't actually read Peter Pan myself. Do you think that's something we should read sometime, Kefri? I'd be more than happy to. What said the little snowdrop? Between two trees is a rope hanging. There is a piece of board upon it. It is a swing. Two pretty little girls, in dresses white as snow, and with long green ribbons fluttering from their hats, are sitting upon it, swinging. Their brother, who is taller than they are, stands in the swing. He has one arm round the rope. To steady himself, in one hand he holds a little bowl, and in the other a clay pipe. Is blowing bubbles as the swing goes on the bubbles fly upward reflecting the most beautiful varying colors the last sail hangs from the bowl of a pipe and sways in the wind on goes the swing and then a little black dog comes running up he is almost as light as the bubbles and he raises himself on his hind legs and he wants to be taken into the swing but it does not stop and the dog falls and then he barks and gets angry the children stroop towards him in the bubble burst, a swinging plank, a light sparkling from foam picture. That is my story. It may be very pretty what you are telling me, but you speak so mournfully and you do not mention little Kay at all. Caffrey, you aren't forcing me by giving me a suggestion, especially since I've already asked you if you'd like to see it. Clay pipe has jokes on the brain running through. Hmm. I'm afraid I'm not familiar with any jokes about clay pipes. What do the hyacinths say? There were three beautiful sisters, fair and delicate. The dress of one was red, of the second blue, and the third pure white. Hand in hand, they danced in the bright moonlight by the calm lake. But they were human beings, not fairy elves sweet fragrance attached to them and they disappeared in the wood. Here the fragrance became stronger. Three coffins in which lay three beautiful maidens glided from the thickest part of the forest across the lake. The fireflies flew lightly over them like little floating torches. Do the maidens dance or sleep or are they dead? The scent of the flowers says they are corpses. The evening bell tolls their knell. You make me quite sorrowful said little Gerda. Your perfume is too strong. You make me think of the dead maidens. 
Oh, is little Kay really dead then? The roses have been in the earth and they say no. Lang cling, told the hyacinth bells. We are not tolling for little Kay. We do not know him. We sing our songs, the only one we know. Then Gerda went to the buttercups that were glittering amongst the brightly green leaves. You are bright little suns. Tell me if you know where I can find my playfellow. And the buttercup sparkled gaily and looked again at Gerda. What song could the buttercup sing? It was not about Kay. The warm bright sun shone on a little court on the first warm day of spring. His white beams rested on the white walls of the neighboring house. And close by bloomed the first yellow flower of the season, glittering like gold in the sun's warm ray. An old woman sat in her armchair at the house door, and her granddaughter, a poor and pretty servant maid, came to see her for a short visit. When she kissed her grandmother, there was gold everywhere, the gold of her heart and that holy kiss. It was a golden morning, and the gold in the beaming sunlight, gold in the leaves of the lowly flower, and on the lips of the maiden. There, that is my story, said the buttercup. Oh, my poor old grandmother. She is longing to see me and grieving for me as she did for little Kay. But I shall soon go home now and take little Kay with me. It is no use asking the flowers. They know only their own songs and can give me no information. And then she tucked up her little dress that she might run faster. But the Narcissus caught her by the leg as she was jumping over it. So she stopped and looked at the tall yellow flower and said, Perhaps you may know something. I can see it myself. I can see it myself, said the Narcissus. Oh, how sweet is my perfume. Up in a little room with a bow window stands a little dancing girl, half undressed. She stands sometimes on one leg and sometimes on both, and looks as if she would tread the whole world under her feet. She is nothing but a delusion. She is pouring water out of a teapot on a piece of stuff which she holds in her hand. It is her bodice. Cleanliness is a good thing, she says. Her white dress hangs on a peg. It has also been washed in the teapot and dried on the roof. She puts it on and ties saffron-coloured handkerchief around her neck, which makes the dress look whiter. See how she stretches out her legs as if she were showing off for on a stem. I can see myself. I can see myself. What do I care for all that? You need not tell me such stuff. And then Gerda ran to the other end of the garden. The door was fastened, but she pressed against the rusty latch and it gave way. The door sprang open and little Gerda ran out with bare feet into the wide world. She looked back three times, but no one seemed to be following her. At last, she could run no longer, so she sat down to rest on a great stone, and when she looked round, she saw that the summer was over, and autumn very far advanced. She had known nothing of this in the beautiful garden, where the sun shone and the flowers grew all year round. Oh, how I have wasted my time, said little Gerda. It is autumn! I must not rest any longer! And she rose up to go on, but her little feet were wounded and sore, and everything round her looked so cold and bleak. The long willow leaves were quite yellow, the dew drops fell like water, leaf after leaf dropped from the tree, the slow thorn alone still bore fruit, but the slow soles were sour and set the teeth on edge. Oh, how dark and weary the whole world appeared! Well, four, so that's the third story out of seven for the Snow Queen. We've been at this for about two hours. I could probably keep going. What do you think, chat? Would you like to see me continue on with this? Or should we start looking for a raid target? Pokemon Go is a fun one, although I prefer Pokemon Unite in terms of uh, Pokemon games for mobile. And perhaps a personal preference. 
I'm holding up fairly well, Caffrey. Um, but I do need to drink a little bit more water here and take just a short break to keep my voice from getting too strained. Um, a lot of the voices that we've been using here tonight are feminine voices. And the same problem from this, uh, it, it's the same problem that I have when I've got a story with a lot of masculine voices. If I'm not careful, I'll just end up straining my voice. Um, so I do need a little more of a variety. Yes, Venny, you've played it with me. Ah. <laughs> <sighs> Venny, you have me as one of your friends in Pokemon Unite. <laughs> Alright. But, I think I do need just a short break here, so we are going to do a small musical interlude. Um, normally I prefer to do songs that are in the public domain, but I think somebody had requested one that I'm, uh, I'd like to at least give it a try. So, <clears throat> I know that your powers of retention are as wet as a warthog's backside, but thick as you are, pay attention. My words are a matter of pride. It's clear from your vacant expressions. The lights are not all on upstairs, but we're talking kings in succession. Even you can't be caught unawares. So prepare for the chance of a lifetime. Be prepared for sensational news. A shining new era is tiptoeing nearer. And where do we feature? Just listen to teacher. I know it sounds sordid, but you'll be rewarded when at last I am given my dues. And injustice deliciously square. Be prepared. Yeah, we'll be prepared. Uh, prepared for what? For the death of the king. What, is he sick? No, you idiot, we're gonna kill him. Simba too. Yeah, all right. Who needs a king? No king, no king. La 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 la. Idiots! There will be a king. Only, but you said I will be king. Stick with me, and you will never grow hungry again. Yeah, all right. Long live the king. Long live the king. <laughs> it's great that we'll soon be connected With a king will be long time adored Of course, quid pro quo, you're expected To take certain duties on board The future's littered with prizes And though I'm the main addressee The point that I must emphasize is you won't get a snip without me! So prepare for the chaku of the century. Be prepared for the murkiest scam. Tenacity spanning, veracity planning. Deceit and great guile are simply why I'll be king undisputed, respected, saluted, and seen for the wonder I am. Yes, my teeth and ambition are bad. Be prepared. Yes, our teeth and ambitions are bad. Be prepared. So, to anybody who is sleeping that I just woke up with that move, um, sorry about that. Also, hello, Naruto. Yes, I went live two hours ago. I was trying to decide if we should stop or if we should continue on with the Snow Queen. Uh, we did read The Little Mermaid earlier. <laughs> you are a lot of things, Naruto, including quite silly. <laughs> oh, thank you, Kafri. I really appreciate it. 
All right, a little more hydration. Oh, thank you, Darth. I do like to sing sometimes as well. And you'll notice there is a sing redeem if anybody has the points for it. You're always more than welcome to throw something in there. Um, if it's a song that I know, happy to sing it. And Venny, don't worry too much about memory. It's a tricky thing. And I've noticed that most of the stuff involving me seems to be stuff that you've forgotten, which is totally fine. <laughs> Ooh, Naruto, you were reading a comic. You're definitely going to have to let me know which one it is. I'm absolutely delighted to get to read comics. <laughs> oh, you had to keep yourself from singing along? That's a shame. I would have loved it if you sang along. It's always good to have more voices. Well, that stretched out my voice quite nicely. And it gave me a chance to recover a little. I think I'm feeling awake enough to continue on. Fourth story. The Prince and the Princess. Gerda was obliged to rest again, and just opposite the place where she sat, she saw a great crow come hopping across the snow toward her. He stood looking at her for some time, and then he wagged his head and said, Oh, oh. Good day! Good day! He pronounced the words as plainly as he could, because he meant to be kind to the little girl, and then he asked her where she was going all alone in the wide world. Hmm. Well, Naruto, as always, please see me after class. The word alone Gerda understood very well and knew how much it expressed. So then she told the crow the whole story of her life and adventures and asked him if he had seen little Kay. Okay, that's fair. Uh, not wanting to wake up other humans is always an appropriate task. Thank you. The crow nodded his head very gravely and said, Perhaps I have, it may be. So menacing? Hmm. Well, I didn't mean to spook Naruto. And let's be blunt, Naruto doesn't seem easily spooked by me these days anyway. No. Do you think you have? cried little Gerda, and she kissed the crow and hugged him almost to death with joy. Gently. Gently! <laughs> I believe I know. I think it may be little Kay, but he has certainly forgotten you by this time for the princess. Mm, does he live with the princess? Yes, listen, but it is so difficult to speak your language. If you understand the crow's language, then I can explain it better, do you? No, I've never learned it. But my grandmother understands it, and she used to speak it to me. Oh, if only I had learned it. It does not matter. I will explain as well as I can, although it will be very badly done. He told her what he had heard. In this kingdom, where we are now, there lives a princess who is so wonderfully clever that she has read all the newspapers in the world, and forgotten them too, although she is so clever. A short time ago, she was sitting on her throne, which people say is not such an agreeable seat as is often supposed. She began to sing a song, which commences in the words, Why should I not be married? Oh, why not indeed, said she. And so she determined to marry if she could find a husband who knew what to say when he was spoken to, and not one who could l only look grand, for that was so tiresome. Hmm. Oh dear, I might have to drop this voice. I'm sorry, folks. Let me see if I can find something a little less painful to put in. <sighs> then she assembled all her court ladies together at the beat of the drum, and when they heard her intentions, they were very well pleased. We're so glad to hear it, said they. 
We were talking about it ourselves the other day. You may believe that every word I tell you is true, for I have a team sweetheart who goes freely about the palace, and she told me all this. Of course, the sweetheart was a crow, for birds of a feather flock together, and one crow always chooses another crow. Free-spirited mindsets can be quite nice, Naruto. And, you know, I'm glad you managed to find it, Darth. Head losing headphones can always be such a painful experience. Newspapers were published immediately with a border of hearts and the initials of a princess among them. They gave notice that every young man who was handsome was free to visit the castle and speak with the princess, and also could reply loud enough to be heard when spoken to, or to make themselves quite at home in the palace. But the ones who spoke best would be chosen as a husband for the princess. Yes, yes, you may believe me. It is all as true as I sit here. The people came in crowds. There was a great deal of crushing and running about, but no one ever succeeded either on the first or second day. They could all speak very well while they were outside in the streets, but when they entered the palace gates, they saw the guards in silver uniforms and the footmen in their golden livery, and the staircase and all the great halls lighted up, and they became quite confused. And when they stood before the throne on which the princess sat, they could do nothing but repeat the last words she had said, and she had no particular wish to hear her own words over again. It was just as if they had all taken something to make them sleepy while they were in the palace, for they did not recover themselves nor speak till they got back again into the street. There was never quite a long line of them reaching from the town gate to the palace. I went myself to see them. They were hungry and thirsty, for at the palace they did not get even a glass of water. Some of the wisest had taken a few slices of bread and butter with them, but they did not share it with their neighbors. They thought if they went to the princess looking hungry, there would be a better chance for themselves. Mm. <laughs> well, that's quite flattering that you think so of me, Naruto. Hmm. But Kay, tell me about little Kay. Was he amongst the crowd? Stop a bit. We're just coming to him. It was on the third day. There came marching cheerfully along to the palace a little personage without horses or carriage, his eyes sparkling like yours. He had beautiful long hair, but his clothes were very poor. Mm, that was Kay. Oh, then I have found him. He had a little knapsack on his back. And no, it must have been his sledge, for he went away with it. Well, it may have been so. I did not look at it very closely. I know on my team, sweetheart, that he passed through the gates, saw the guards in the silver uniform and the servants in their libraries of gold on the stairs, but he was not in the least embarrassed. It must be very tiresome to stand light on the stairs, he said. I prefer to go in. The rooms were blazing with light. Counselors and ambassadors walked about with bare feet, carrying golden vessels. It was enough to make anyone feel serious. His boots creaked loudly as he walked, and yet he was not at all uneasy. <laughs> it must be Kay. I know he had new boots on. I have heard them creak in my grandmother's room. Oh, they really did creak, said the crow, yet he went boldly up to the princess herself. Oh, yet he went boldly up to the princess herself, who was sitting on a pearl as large as a spinning wheel, and all the ladies of the court were present with their maids, and all the cavaliers with their servants, and each of the maids had another maid to wait upon her, and the cavalier's servants had their own servants, as well as a page each. They all stood in circles around the princess, and the nearer they stood to the door, the prouder they looked. The servants' pages, who always wore slippers, could hardly be looked at, and they held themselves up so proudly by the door. It must be quite awful. But did Kay win the princess? If I had not been a crow, I would have married her myself, although I am engaged. He spoke just as well as I do when I speak the crow's language, so I heard from my tame sweetheart. He was quite free and agreeable, and said he had not come to woo the princess, but hear her wisdom, and he was as pleased with her as she was with him. Oh, certainly that was Kay. 
He was so clever, he could work mental arithmetic and fractions. Oh, will you take me to the palace? It is very easy to ask that, but how are we to manage it? However, I will speak about it to my team sweetheart and ask her advice. For I must tell you, it will be very difficult to gain permission for a little girl like you to enter the palace. Oh, yes, but I should gain permission easily. For when Kay hears that I am here, he will come out and fetch me immediately. Wait for me here by the palings, said the crow, wagging his head as he flew away. It was late evening before the crow returned. Rock ah he said. She sends you greeting, and here's a little roll which she took from the kitchen for you. There's plenty of bread there, and she thinks you might be hungry. It is not impossible for you it is not possible for you to enter the palace by the front entrance. The guards in silver uniform and servants in gold livery would not allow it. But do not cry, we will manage to get you in. My sweetheart knows a little back staircase that leads to the sleeping apartments, and she knows where to find the key. I really regret this crow voice. <laughs> they went into the garden through the great avenue, where the leaves were falling one after another, and could see the lights in the palace being put out in the same manner. The crow led little Gerda to a back door, which stood ajar. Oh, how little Gerda's heart beats with anxiety and longing. It was just as if she were going to do something wrong, and yet she only wanted to know where little Kay was. It must be he, she thought, with those clear eyes and that long hair. She could fancy she saw him smiling at her as he used to at home when they sat among the roses. He would certainly be glad to see her and hear what a long distance she had come for his sake. And to know how sorry they had been at home because he did not come back. Oh, what joy and yet fear she felt. There were now on the stairs and in the small closet at the top a lamp was burning. In the middle of the floor stood the tame crow, turning her head from side to side and gazing at Gerda who curtsied it as her grandmother had taught her to do. <laughs> Naruto, doing a straining voice for a short period is not usually a huge deal. I did not expect the crow to monologue for a page and a half. That's it, Those are two very different things. But also, yes, it's important to be careful. You're not wrong. Oh, boy. I am out of water, so it's going to take me just a moment to get it refilled here. Mm. You're right, it is my own fault. But I'd feel silly if I just started switching up voices willy-nilly without letting people know what it is I'm doing. And that is a rather silly thing to do, isn't it? To switch voices with no real warning. Oh, hello Elise! How are you, dearie? Good to see you. Thank you so much for dropping in. So, for those not familiar, Elise Vermillion is a wonderful young lady. Um, she's been doing a fair amount of Persona in recent months, although, honestly, I haven't been able to catch her streams recently. Um, she is somebody who... <laughs> if it saves my voice, you don't care, Naruto? That's good to hear. Um, but Elise is, um, a as a bit of a warning, a significant amount more uh, blunt, and, and some of the things that she says will come off as significantly more grating. However, if you are a grown adult and happen to enjoy something a little more caustic in your uh, experiences, it's absolutely delightful to spend some time with Elise. Um, <laughs> yes, Elise, I'm doing well, thank you. How are you doing, dearie? It's been far too long. Mm. <laughs> oh, okay. There we are. Hmm. My betrothed has spoken very highly of you, my little lady, said the tame crow. Your life history, Vita, as it might be called, is very touching. 
If you will take the lamp, I will walk before you. We will go straight along this way, then we shall meet no one. It seems to me as if somebody were behind us, said Gerda, as something rushed by her like a shadow on the wall, and then horses with flying manes and thin legs, hunters, ladies and gentlemen on horseback, glided by her like shadows on the wall. Oh, Elise, I'm delighted to hear you made it over to Oregon. It's a lovely territory. If you get a chance to stop by some of the parks that they have out there, it's just... It's such a breathtaking time. Um, it's been far too long since I was back there. But it is a lovely area, and I'm glad you're getting a chance to spend time there. <laughs> they are only dreams, said the tame crow. They're coming to fetch the thoughts of the great people out hunting. All the better, for we shall be able to look at them in their beds more safely. I hope that when you rise to honor and favor, you will show a grateful heart. Oh, you may be sure of that, said the crow from the forest. It's hydrate, so... Oh, <laughs> Alex, thank you for the hydrate. <laughs> what weren't you expecting, Alex? <laughs> All right. There's round two. <laughs> I'm glad you like it, Alex. It was actually Kefri's recommendation in terms of the wording on it. So <laughs> have a good lurk and thank you for joining in. It's good to have you here. The only thing that's good that came from Oregon would be Gravity Falls. Hmm. I don't think I agree with you, Naruto. I have several friends from Oregon who are quite delightful. I also don't have alert commands at this point, but thank you for reminding me to set one up, Alex. They now came into the first hall, the walls of which were hung with rose-colored satin, embroidered with artificial flowers. Here, the dreams again fitted by them, but so quickly that Gerda could not distinguish the royal persons. Each hall appeared more splendid than the last, and it was enough to bewilder anyone. At length, they reached a bedroom. The ceiling was like a great palm tree with glass leaves of the mostly clear crystal. Excuse me. And over the center of the floor, two beds, each resembling a lily, hung from a stem of gold. One, in which the princess lay, was white, while the other was red, and this Gerda had to seek for little Kay. She pushed one of the red leaves aside and saw a little brown neck. Oh, that must be Kay! She called his name out quite loud and held the lamp over him. The dreams rushed back into the room on horseback. He woke and turned his head round. It was not little Kay. The prince was only like him in the neck. Still, he was young and pretty. Then the princess peeped out of her white lily bed and asked what was the matter. Then little Gerda wept and told her the story and all that the crows had done to help her. <laughs> ah. Yes, hydrate is a basic redeem, but the wording that I used was one that apparently did delight at least one person, Capri. So, well done on the suggestion, and thank you for the help. Oh, and there's Lexi. Hello and welcome to the chat. How are you? I take it Art Jam is finished then? So, for those of you who are more open to uh, experiences of a uh, more sensual nature, uh, Asterisk Official, or Lexi, is a talented artist and a very entertaining streamer. Um, she's mostly been going through the Fear and Hunger games lately for her streams, um, which are particularly... Uh, they don't hold back in terms of the things that are depicted, but... Uh, if you get a chance to, she's absolutely a delightful person to watch. Um, she has a fantastic cast, and, uh, oh, 
All right, congratulations on raiding out to Ash. Uh, the art jams that she does every couple of Wednesdays collect a series of different artists from around Twitch and just bring an absolute delight. Uh, it's a fun time, everybody gets to enjoy, and they get to create some really fun art. Um, so if you get a chance, I strongly encourage you to check out her channel and check out the artwork that they all make. Lexi, thank you so much for subscribing. Um, I don't expect it of anyone, but I, I'm really glad you've chosen to. Thank you. Um. <laughs> uh, it's not exactly that, Ash, but... You're right, Lexi, you now have a Founder Badge. Congratulations. <laughs> Naruto, th this should not really surprise anyone. <laughs> oh, Kefri, I'm sorry you're still getting errors. You were the first one to subscribe to me, and it's frustrating that it won't give you the badge as well. <laughs> I'm glad you'll wear it with pride, Lexi. Ah, oh, thank you so much. I, I really do appreciate it. That's, it's been a stressful time, and I, I really do appreciate you helping out in that way. Thank you. You poor child, said the prince and princess. They praised the crows and said they were not angry with them for what they had done, but it must not happen again, and this time they should be rewarded. Would you like to have your freedom? asked the princess. Or would you prefer to be raised in the position of court crows, with all that is left in the kitchen for yourselves? Then both the crows bowed and begged to have a fixed appointment, for they thought of their old age and said it would be so comfortable to feel that they had provisions for their old days, as they called it. And then the prince got out of bed and gave it up to Gerda. He could do no more, and she lay down. She folded her little hands and thought, How good everybody is to me! Men and animals, too. Then she closed her eyes and fell into a sweet sleep. All the dreams came flying back again to her, and they looked like angels. And one of them drew a little sledge, on which Kay sat and nodded to her. But all this was only a dream and vanished as soon as she woke up. Um... <laughs> As far as why an easily bored emote, um, because I had commissioned a few emotes from Road to Dusk, and one of them I wanted to be a pouting emote, um, and I thought easy was particularly well suited to that. Um, so for those who are uh, interested, e easy doesn't uh, stream quite so much right now, but... Uh, Easy is a good friend of mine, as well as one of my roommates, and she has taken to streaming EverQuest 2. Um, it's just generally a good time to spend time with her. <laughs> Lexi with all the shrugs. Thank you. <laughs> all right. The following day, she was dressed from head to foot in silk and velvet, and they invited her to stay at the palace for a few days and enjoy herself but she only begged for a pair of boots and a little carriage and horse to draw it, so that she might go out into the wide worlds and seek for Kay. And she obtained not only boots, but also a muff, and she was neatly dressed, and when she was ready to go, there at the door she found a coach made of pure gold, with the coat of arms of the prince and princess shining upon it like a star, and the coachman, footman, and outriders all wearing golden crowns on their head. The prince and princess themselves helped her into the coach, and wished her success. The forest crow, who was now married, accompanied her for the first three miles. He sat by Gerda's side, as he could not bring him bear riding backward. The tame crow stood in the doorway and flapped her wings. She could not go with them, because she had been suffering from headache ever since her new appointment. No doubt from eating too much. The coach was well stored with sweet cakes, and under the seat were fruit and gingerbread nuts. Farewell, farewell, cried the prince and princess, and little Gerda wept, and the crow wept, and then after a few miles the crow also said, Farewell, and this was the saddest parting. However, he flew to a tree and stood flapping his black wings as long as he could see the coach, which glittered in the bright sunshine. 
Why does the name Road to Dusk sound familiar? Well... <laughs> Road is an artist and also... Oh, I apparently tried to shout out too soon. Rhoda is also part of uh, Lexi's general community and circles. Yes, he is a very good noodle. Um, he's also somebody who is quite good at educating. Um, he talks a lot about uh, some specific neurodivergences. Um, many times there are references to uh, dissociative identity and things of that nature that he talks with. Um, Friday nights, I also tend to do Coffee Talk streams with Road. Um, so the game Coffee Talk 2 is the one that we've been doing most recently. And um, I do some of the voice acting for it. He does some of the voice acting. Uh, we often have Joju of Laria along with us, as well as several other people from the community. Um, it's a grand time. It doesn't get to happen every week, but we do our best to make it happen as often as we can. Um, so I do recommend that if you're interested in some more uh, intellectual content mixed with video games as a backing, uh, Road is absolutely wonderful. He's also a linguist, and uh, so he'll go into some of the most fascinating tangents at the drop of a hat. <laughs> mm. Also, we have come to the fifth story, which means we are over halfway there. Yes, Naruto, I'm well aware of your preference on that. However, we've already been raided by one other storyteller tonight who was doing some teaching herself. Or, I suppose I should do a pronoun check. Um, but the individual had a feminine name and used a feminine avatar, so I assumed uh, feminine pronouns. Um, so, yes, I, I expect that some people might be particularly interested in Rhodes' content. <clears throat> Ooh, wow, though. That was... Mm. That crow voice might have done a little more damage than I expected, unfortunately. I think we need to raid out at this point. Um, but thank you to everyone. <laughs> thank you to everyone who joined me here tonight. If anyone has a particular raid target that they would recommend, uh, please let me know. Um... <laughs> hey, see, Naruto. Oh, the halfway there. Whoa, living on a prayer. Uh, give me just a little bit to check who Sokon is. Um, they are not currently live, Naruto. Sorry. Oh, Venny, thank you so much for joining in. <laughs> it was lovely to see you again as well. I sincerely hope that we get more time to spend together here. Um, let's see, is there anyone that is currently being recommended? Mm. <laughs> Vinny, I also had a nice time. Um, I'm going to probably hold off on that particular wording here, uh, just because of how I tend to do with my stream. Um, but I, I appreciate you, you know, doing your best to fix things there. Take my hands, we'll make it, I swear. <clears throat> oh, that, that wasn't going to end well. Alright. Um, I think if we don't have any recommendations at this point... Um, hmm. Oh! You know, I do think I see somebody who would be a solid raid target, though. 
Um, this person is uh, somebody who I've known for a fair amount of time here. Um, and he's he, he's not always wholesome, but he's generally pretty wholesome. <laughs> he's a overall good bean. Um, and it's been entirely too long since I actually chatted with him. So, um, thank you everybody for showing up. I appreciate all of you coming out and listening to me read. Um, special thanks to our raiders here tonight. Um, that we had raids from, uh, both Sophia and, um, oh, we had one right at the start of stream too. Uh, oh heck, who was that? Um, boo boo boo. Let me take just a moment here. Uh, oh, right. Pa uh, raided me right away, too. Um, but yes. Naruto. No. Just... No. <laughs> but yes, thank you for everybody joining in. And... Uh, yeah, I think with that, we will raid out to Demon Lord Pyro. So, uh, looks like he is playing Hogwarts Legacy tonight. Um, and we will go from there. Thank you once again, everybody, for joining in. And I will see you all next time. <laughs>